microphone now. The yeah. mic on. I hope so. Okay, Otherwise, it'll be an intimate <laughs> chat. <laughs> I'd like to begin this morning by asking you about flying. If there's been one constant in your life, besides your wife Annie, it's flying. Mm -hmm. You had your first airplane ride in a Waco biplane when you were eight. You've been a pilot since your teens, and you still fly. Mm -hmm. Of all the aircraft and spacecraft you've flown in, can you tell us which has been your favorite and your least favorite ride? I could, but before we start that, just one remark here to begin with. I uh, appreciate being here and being invited today, and thank you all very much. And I think we probably, after that movie, should just end it right here, not while, <laughs> while I'm ahead. <laughs> this is a little bit like a dinner Annie and I attended back home in Ohio not too long ago, and Annie's sitting right over here. At least, at the, uh, We attend this dinner and the person introducing me got all carried away, gave accolades and accomplishments I never dreamed of having in this life or the next, and uh, finally finished up by saying, there are few truly great men in this world, and then he introduced me. Now that's, that's pretty heady stuff. <laughs> and so I guess I was uh, going home that night, I was still thinking about that introduction a little bit, and I said, uh, Annie, you know if you think about it, there aren't very many really truly great men in this world and took her about two seconds to say, let me tell you something, there's sure one lesson you think there is. <laughs> <laughs> so she keeps things on an even keel in our family over here. Anyway. Okay, back to the first question, don't wanna waste time here. Uh, flying, the favorite airplanes and so Favorite on. ride of any kind. Oh, right, well, favorite ride was space ride, obviously, and, and uh, we've been very fortunate, but they have the opportunity to do a lot of different things and uh, in flying and in space. And so I feel very fortunate to have been in the position that we were in. And it seems like in life at every time something came along and, and uh, maybe we're getting into a, <coughs> staying in a particular position for a while, something new would come along, be a new opportunity. And uh, so we've, we've had a, a time, but uh, I guess all the airplanes you ever fly where you did something for the first time in uh, are the ones that you really remember. Uh, I remember the first airplane I ever soloed. I was a, uh, a junior in high school, or in the college, and uh, they started the old CPT program, Civilian Pilot Training Program, prior to World War II. And uh, I've, they offered this as a, a, a program. Government paid for your flight lessons, and you could get your, uh, uh, your private pilot's license out of it, and also uh, get your, get physics credit for it in college, and that was a twofer that I couldn't resist. <laughs> and uh, so I signed up for that, and that's, and I, the first airplane I ever flew then was this little old Taylor Craft, 65 horsepower Taylor Craft. And uh, so that, I still remember that airplane to this day very, very well. Uh, and then later on in World War II, flew the Corsair that the old uh, inverted gull wing, uh, Navy and Marine Corps fighter that uh, and I loved that airplane. I still have more time in that than any plane I ever flew. Got almost 3,000 hours of flight time in that old airplane. And then the uh, cross-country run in the FHU Crusader that I had done a lot of the test work on. And uh, loved, loved, like those two airplanes, those were my real favorites of prop planes and jet planes, I guess. And then, of course, uh, Mercury was a, the first orbital flight, and that was a, a, we'll never forget that one. That always has a place in my heart. You had to fly that the and, last two orbits, right? Well, so we had some emergencies on that that uh, meant that I had to take over and fly it manually instead of automatically. So uh, anyway, that's a long answer to your short question. <laughs> no, that's fine. Well, speaking of your orbital flight, um, Shepard and Grissom had gone up before you, yeah. and you were the, the third. And the American public, I think, didn't realize how different your flight was going to be and what the preparations were compared to the suborbital flight, including the rockets. Um, can you explain why your flight was much more ambitious and much riskier? Well, the, the rocket, the uh, first flights that Al Shepard and Gus Grissom went up on, the first out, first out into space, really, were suborbital, by which you mean it's a, it's a probe. You shoot things straight up like this, and it goes up there until it runs out and then comes back down again like that. What we were building up to, though, was the orbital flight, and that was the one that I made, and uh, we had three orbits. I think people forget, too, what things were like back in those days, is what the impetus was. 
uh, you've got to remember that those were the those were the depths of the Cold War, days of depths of the Cold War, and uh, the Soviets at that time had been taking a lot of young people from all over the world, taking them to the Soviet Union, giving them their education, sending them back to their home countries as indoctrinated communists, and the jury was still out as to which way the, the world was going to go, really. And you look back now and read some of the editorials back in those days, and it was sort of, were we going to have to accommodate to the Soviet Union, and was this going to be a, a long-term thing for the future? And, and so there was that kind of competition uh, in the program, and uh, they were claiming that they were superior to us in science and technology and research, and, uh, and they could make a pretty good case for it because they were orbiting things when our pa uh, we were still blowing up on the launch pad quite often. <coughs> and so uh, those were, we, we saw the early days of the space program as really having to come back from uh, the world's view that we, the United States might really be in a deficit position in these areas. And so we, uh, uh, we saw it as a, uh, you almost went on a space flight back then as almost like a, a combat mission. You were out to, uh, to really prove something. And uh, so those, those were the, the first step was to just see if we get this up and down. And, and then the, the uh, next jump was to go into orbital flight, which I was fortunate to be picked to do. And uh, so that, that started us back, I think. And I think the American people, some of you may be old enough to remember, the, not many in here, but some of you may be old enough to remember those days. And I think there was sort of a, we were sort of at a low as far as a national psyche uh, went. And uh, I think some of those early flights really showed that we were back in the game again, and particularly when we made the, the orbital flight and then all the, the uh, excitement that followed that. And uh, then we had a number of successes and, and we were on the way back. So it was some, sort of from that depths of the Cold War was when we were launching those first spacecraft. How did it feel to be sitting in that capsule that morning? You had been in and out of it a few yeah. times because of scrub launches. Yeah. Can you tell us about well, there, that? Yeah, well, how do you feel during launch? You get asked that every once in a while, and there's sort of a, a standard question you ask back. How do you think you'd feel if you knew you were on top of two million parts built by the lowest bidder on a government contract? <laughs> But it was more than that. You were, you were glad, you thought you were very fortunate to be right where you were. And uh, so that we just, actually you didn't, you, 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 uh, people asked, did you pray and all that stuff. Yeah, you prayed that you wouldn't foul up. When you first reached orbit, uh, what, what did it feel like? You'd been prepared or you, you'd been yeah. trained. And was the true experience anything like the simulated experience? Well, you can't simulate weightlessness here on Earth. The only way you can simulate that, and we had done it for very short periods of time, but it's very transitory. Uh, you can dive down an airplane like this, and you can pull up and push over to where you just float free in the cockpit. Or, or not in the cockpit, but back in the cabin. Just float free. And it's not like this jolt you may have gone through on an airliner where you hit the belt in a thunderstorm or something. It's not like that. But where you're in a steady state of being of floating free. And there's no way you can simulate it. When you do this in an airplane, a padded, uh, uh, padded uh, airplane, so you don't hurt yourself back there, they push over, you just float free and come up over the top, big parabolic curve here and down the other side. And you can only hold that for about oh, 30, 35 seconds. And so you get that amount of free float uh, that is supposed to simulate zero G, and it does. And it, it's a good simulation, except it's very limited. And you're just beginning to get accustomed to it, and, and they start pulling out down here, and you're back on the floor again. Uh, so it's a, that's the only kind of training that you really have for it. And you're up there on the space flight, and you really get into, uh, uh, when you get into really steady state, it's a wonderful feeling because you're, you're floating, and uh, you can loosen up the straps a little bit. And on, on uh, Mercury, of course, the, the spacecraft was so small uh, there wasn't any place to float to. You're just in there, <laughs> but you could loosen the straps, and uh, and that that was uh, sort of it. In fact, we used to joke about in the Mercury, you didn't get into it, you put it on. <laughs> uh, and so the that's one experience. Now on the second flight, though, in uh, in '97 or '98, I'm sorry, '98, it was a uh, that's a different experience because in that one. 
Then you got out, and you actually floated around, you changed clothes, got more comfortable, got the big uh, pumpkin suit, the orange suit off, and, uh, and got into more comfortable clothes, and then that was what you're gonna be in for the rest of the mission. And in that, there was a lot of space. You, had a, you were in a mid-deck where I was, was about uh, 12, 13 feet across, about uh, seven feet high, and about uh, 10 feet across the other way. And you could float out and up the ladder and up into the flight deck or go back through the, uh, there's a tube about uh, three feet across in which you could float back into the cargo bay, into the uh, space hab where all of our, re most of our research was done back there. And so you could move around and float around and that, that was the feeling that was fun. That was better than being on Project Mercury. <laughs> and uh, it's a, uh, uh, you be accustomed to it, you become accustomed to it rather rapidly as far as your feelings go. Now your body readapts though over a period of time. And once your body over in the first day or so realizes it's up here in your steady state, you no longer need the same body uh, amounts of fluid in your legs and the lower abdom abdominal area. And uh, so there's a fluid shift, they call it. And you not only throw off a lot more of the of body uh, water and so on to adjust, adjust for this, but your body is adjusting to keeping uh, water in the upper half of the body. And you, uh, uh, and you, we joke with each other because everyone's face fills, fills out. <laughs> and call it moon face. And that's what it looked like. People, at the, you look at each other and you want to laugh because they look so strange. And it takes another, uh, uh, another uh, day or so before you adapt from that. Now, on the way back in then, when you're re-entering, you want to redo that, that uh, uh, water in your body because you're gonna need it once you get back on the ground and your fluid starts uh, going back into the abdominal area and the extremities of the uh, legs. And so you rehydrate yourself uh, with uh, salty fluid on, before you start re-entry coming back in so your body will absorb that, uh, that moisture and you won't uh, tend to stand up after you get back in. And when, once the body fluid starts shifting down then tend to black out. Uh, so that's been a problem they had to, to solve on that. But uh, anyway. Thank you. Well, you just spoke about uh, the late 50s and early 60s being the depths of the Cold War. Mm -hmm. And when President Kennedy made his speech in 1961 about landing a man on the moon by yeah. the end of the decade, um, many believed that his motivation was purely uh, Cold War one-upsmanship rather than the, the science. Mm -hmm. But you had the opportunity to spend time with him over the next year or so. And I just wonder if you can talk about uh, whether his, his uh, views of the space program changed? Well, I think, it, I think they did, and I think uh, his interest in it was all the above, everything you, you said. I think there was a political aspect to it, of course, international political aspect to it. Uh, and so he, he set that as a goal. His, all the engineering people thought, yes, we could go to the moon, we could set the uh, goal on that. And uh, we didn't really need to make any technical breakthroughs, but it was gonna be one giant, enormous uh, engineering job to uh, put this whole thing together and do it in the time frame in which he had he'd suggested we could do it. And uh, that wasn't done in the blind. He, did, he made those estimates off of what the engineering uh, people in NASA and others told him we, they thought we could do. So it was a, uh, it was a, a big time period where uh, uh, I think he had those motivations you mentioned. I think he also was interested in it just from a personal standpoint. Uh, one th if there's one thing I think is common among people that we look back on and think they accomplished a lot and they were, they were sort of, we could put them down on a list of great people or thinkers or whatever, I think it's that they, uh, they're curious about almost everything around them. And if you think about it, every, every step forward in, uh, in whatever we've done, uh, whether it's uh, science and technology, uh, medicine, uh, uh, Toby Cosgrove back here is head of Cleveland Clinic and invited us. Where's Toby? Toby, there he is, and a good friend, and he runs the Cleveland Clinic. That's one of the greatest medical centers in the world, and yet that medical center wouldn't make one single advance if there wasn't a person, a person who wondered, hey, can't we do this better this way or have a new idea for how to do things? If I can do a little research, we could learn to do this. And all of human progress, whether it's medicine or whatever it is, 
is based on that kind of a curious attitude. And I think John Kennedy was that type of person. He really, uh, whatever you may think of his politics, and I'm sure we could get a good argument started on that here, but uh, whatever, he was a very curious person about everything around him. Uh, not long before the flight, a couple of months before I was to go up, uh, they asked me to go to the White House and brief him on what the flight was going to accomplish. And uh, so, or what we had as an objective. And so I, I, uh, I went up there and we were in the uh, uh, Oval Office part of the time then moved out into the cabinet room and, and sat there at the table and I was briefing. I had the papers and diagrams. But every time I stopped, he would ask about six questions about what, was, what I meant by so-and-so and so-and-so. And, -so and, -so. and uh, I finally said, Mr. President, I think maybe I came ill-prepared. What I should have done was bring some of the models and things. Would you like for me to come back and explain these more fully? Yes, he would. So I came back about a week later and brought the models and stuff he could take apart and all sorts of <laughs> things, and he loved it. And, but the follow-up to this was that uh, after the flight, and we came back and I was at, at the Cape, and they came, he came down to the Cape to, uh, uh, to uh, see me and to see the spacecraft. And, and uh, so I was, we had the spacecraft was back there and the hatch was off the side. And you could look in and see all the handles and everything. And he remembered every one of those things that I had uh, talked about, about here's what we do if there's an emergency. I'll, I would plan to pull this handle and that handle and go to this control and so on. And he remembered all those sequences very, very well. And I was a little bit surprised by it. And he wanted to know how they had worked and so on and explained it to him. So he was a very curious person. And I think he, he really had that personal interest uh, in the space program also. Well, curiosity spans disciplines, obviously. Yeah. And I'm wondering if that's something that you as test pilots, you and the other six, shared. Uh, what was your view of the Mercury program? Did you see it as Cold War uh, posturing? Did you see it as science, as frontiers? Uh, how did you think about it? I saw it as both. They had, uh, part of its immediate impetus, of course, was from the Cold War, as I said a little while ago. But uh, beyond that, I always did think that here we were for the first time being able to travel uh, outside the Earth's atmosphere. And uh, incidentally, we decided that she's going to handle outer space, I'm going to handle inner space. <laughs> uh, and, and so we, we uh, uh, now I lost my whole train of thought. Okay. <laughs> anyway, go ahead, next question. It'll come back to It'll us. Come back. <laughs> well, actually, this is a, an interesting question. When you returned from space, you were a hero, if you'll permit me to use that word. Uh, a few years after your flight, you collected some of the many letters that you and your family had received and published a book. Can you tell us the title of the book and where it came from? Yeah, it was, uh, the title of the book was I Listened to Your Heartbeat. And uh, the, uh, how I came to write, do that book was a little unfortunate. I came back from space and all the attention and so on. Uh, and then when uh, I was preparing to run for office, I had declared for the Senate and was back in Ohio, and uh, one morning I was uh, standing at the lavatory and had just finished shaving, and the big plate glass mirror I'd slid aside over here, I couldn't get the thing to move, and it was stuck in this tracks. I lifted it up out of the tracks and set it down over here to clean the tracks out, uh, and I lost uh, my handhold on the mirror. It fell toward me, and uh, it was a big, heavy mirror, and I ducked and threw my uh, hands up like this to protect from the mirror and uh, my the throw rug on the slick tile floor went out from under me and I came down with my head along the the uh, metal rail on the bathtub on well it hit real hard and uh, was right above the left ear here and caused a, a concussion in that area and caused enough of a damage down through that area that it let blood and fluid collect in that area and made it super sensitive uh, so if I moved my head a little bit too fast, I'd spin up the whole world. And here I was, just back in space, and then... <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and everybody, of course, thought there was some connection, and actually the only connection was I was clumsy in the bathroom. That was what, what it was. So the... the uh, anyway, the... Uh, uh, that... Uh, when I was uh, knocked out a little bit in just a few seconds, and when I uh, sort of came to again, I was sort of on one knee on the floor, and there was a pool of blood here where it had uh, cut things back here and cut the top of my head where this hit. Anyway, this uh, did not go away right away. 
And uh, so I was, uh, the doctor finally diagnosed this as once they f could do the angles on the x-rays that showed the little fracture here. And they, uh, uh, the doctor said that it was probably going to be 8 to 12 months before I got recovery from that. Uh, and that about 60% of the people would get full recovery, of which I hoped I would be one, obviously. And uh, so that, that was the, the uh, uh, that was what led then to having time where I really was, when I finally could go home, I was flat in bed, and if I wanted to move to the living room, I'd have to get up and move very, very slowly with my head and actually have a hand on the wall and move down the hallway. It would take me maybe eight or 10 minutes to make that whole transition just from the bedroom down to the living room. Uh, well, I want something to do. And we had received an awful lot of mail. And I had told the people in the mail room, in fact, they estimated in the six months after the flight, uh, there had been somewhere between 350 and 500,000 letters. That's a lot of mail. And they had set up a mail room at NASA headquarters to respond to all these, made sure everybody got an answer. And uh, I had told the people, they had showed me some of the letters coming in that were particularly poignant or particularly of some sort of special interest. And so we, uh, I had told them, toss those off here and put them in some separate boxes, SI mail, I'd like to go, special interest mail, I'd like to go through those later. Well, this was an opportunity to do that. So lying in bed there, I could take these letters in and, and read them. And we took particular uh, uh, phrases out of these things and, and split the letters up into different categories. And uh, where the title of the book came from, during the flight, uh, they'd had an EKG measurement uh, on me that gave my heartbeat and rate and everything, and that went out on radio then down to the control center, and there were times during the flight uh, where they actually put that on and people right. uh, could hear it. And this little girl wrote to me and, and uh, had her very nice letter, and then she had, P.S., I listened to your heartbeat. And so uh, uh, I thought that was significant because uh, we'd received so much mail that was uh, of a thing that people were really uh, expressing themselves about what it meant to them, and uh, a lot of people had uh, listened in. Right. Now, um, in another episode of uh, bringing you down to size, in a way, uh, mm -hmm. in your speech to a joint session of Congress, you told a little story about meeting Caroline Kennedy. <laughs> Can you tell us that? You've done a lot of background, haven't you? <laughs> I'm at Williams College. <laughs> I came back from the flight, uh, came into the Cape, and then there was a weekend there, and then they had asked me to go to Congress and give a speech before the a joint session of Congress. Here I am, big dumb astronaut, never gave a speech to more than 15 people, and they want me to speak to Congress. Okay, so... Uh, we were down at, they took us down over the weekend then to, uh, took the family down uh, to Key West where we could be down there by ourselves for a couple of days and then come back and meet President Kennedy and fly back to uh, Washington with him on Air Force One. So I uh, went down, I wrote the speech I was going to have to Congress and down there and had it typed up and uh, came back up then to uh, uh, where it was anyway. We were going to meet the President and we did. Well, we were in the airplane waiting for the president to come out and get in. And uh, Jackie Kennedy was there with Caroline. And Caroline was about, a, I don't know, four years old or five years old, not more than that. And uh, they weren't going back to Washington, but they wanted to come out. Uh, and Jackie wanted to bring Caroline out to meet us. And so we're in the airplane, and here comes Jackie on the airplane. And, and uh, we had never met her before, and Caroline is with her. And so they come in, and, and uh, Jackie said, uh, now, Caroline, uh, this is Colonel Glenn, and this is Mrs. Glenn here, and he's one just came back from orbital flight. And Caroline looked all around and said, but where's the monkey? <laughs> <laughs> True story. You got another background. Of course, the, the chimp flights had preceded all of this, of course. Anyway. <coughs> well, you knew where you stood. Where's the monkey? Uh, well, I, I've I seen Caroline a number of times since then, and we always laugh about that every time. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, if we could switch now to your uh, political career, maybe it was in the cards already in 1962. Uh, you said you were a big dumb astronaut going to speak to yeah. Congress, but the New York Times reported that you seemed as much at ease speaking to Congress as you did in your space capsule. Uh, but what was it that motivated you to run in 1964? Well, uh, let me go back just a second to that speech to Congress because that was a different one too. When President Kennedy came aboard the airplane down there and they were getting ready to go to Oakley, we were flying to Washington, I thought, well, it'd be just a courtesy. And I had the speech I was to give to Congress, was folded up and was in my pocket. And I thought, well, it'd be a nice courtesy just to show him the speech to make sure I wasn't saying something that was going to offend anybody. And uh, so I took it out and asked him if he'd like to see what I was going to say to Congress. Yes, he did. So he gave it back, he read it, thought it was fine, gave it back to him, I put it back in my pocket. Go to Washington, big parade down there in the, the, uh, the Senate, or in the House chambers where they have the joint meetings up there. And uh, you know, they, the Supreme Court comes in, everybody comes in down there. And uh, so they announced me, and you know, like they, you've seen them announce this, uh, Mr. Speaker, sir, so, 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 so. <laughs> and Colonel John Glenn, <laughs> so here we are. Down the aisle and up on the platform, I get the speech out like this, and I put it down like this and unfold it like that, put it down, I'm all ready, and everybody gets quiet, and I look down at the speech, and I'm looking at page 15. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and I, but I, I pulled the first sheet off like that, and page one was right underneath. And uh, so, uh, anyway, I started my speech. And uh, the first time anybody wanted to clap, I didn't interrupt them. I'm going up there going through <laughs> pages. It turned out President Kennedy, had, he had just left the last uh, uh, page on top, and so I put it under, and everything worked out all right. But honestly, to this day, when I give a speech, if I'm giving it from notes or a text, either one, usually just notes, but uh, I check my notes, the pages. I check them to this day. I check several times to make sure I got now, what was the question? That's a good lesson. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, what was your motivation for running in 1964? Oh, motivation. <laughs> I, yeah. uh, I'd had an interest. Uh, my interest in government and politics didn't just come after the space flight. It came from a, a wonderful teacher I had uh, who taught civics in high school. And he was a wonderful teacher. And... Uh, he just made the study of government and politics, which is what civics was. He just made it into, I looked forward to his classes, and he always had a lot of examples and things, and, and uh, where Annie and I had grown up in a small town, New Concord, it, there was, it was a very, I guess you'd say patriotic town. It was almost like I, I described it as being real life music man. If you remember the music man, the, uh, where there's a lot of comedy with that one, of course, but the. The flags and the parades and things like that were given. That was a given on every national holiday. And, uh, and so we grew up in that kind of an environment. And with his, I always was interested then in government and politics. And, uh, uh, and when I was overseas uh, in, World War, in World War II or Korea, Annie would send me little clippings out of the paper and, and a book or something once in a while about uh, something in government or politics. And always had a, a book around on that and uh, never thought I'd be able to run for, for public, uh, high public office. But uh, there were people who encouraged me to do that after the space flight, and uh, so I, I uh, decided I would do it. And so that was, I'd always been interested in it, and I could think of no higher purpose I could uh, accomplish if I could be in the Senate. That'd be a, that would be a great thing to do. And uh, so that was it. And I think uh, people tend to forget the first time I ran for the Senate, I lost. Didn't do it. Didn't make it. I was a uh, in uh, was defeated in the primary, and uh, the person I ran against then had been an active Democrat in Ohio for his whole lifetime, and contributed much to the party and so on. And uh, I lost by thirteen thousand votes, and I had to decide then whether uh, did I really mean this, and I was going to stay at it, or uh, or was I going to. Uh, do other things and go into business or whatever I was going to go into. And uh, so I, I decided it's something we really wanted to do. And so uh, for the next four years until the next Senate seat came up, uh, Annie and I spent much of that time going to every rubber chicken dinner in you know, <laughs> every county in Ohio just about. And so the next time around then I uh, 
uh, I won and then was in the Senate 24 years. But uh, that beginning was an inauspicious beginning, but uh, you gotta, sometimes you have to decide what you want to do and stick with it. Good advice. When you got to the Senate in 1974, uh, what pleasant surprises and unpleasant surprises caught you? Well, yeah, I guess I'm a little like Harry Truman. They quoted Harry Truman as saying when he first got to the Senate, he walked out on the Senate floor the first time, and he thought, how in heaven's name did I get here anyway? <laughs> and by the time he'd been there six months, when he walked out on the Senate floor, he wondered, how in heaven's name did all those other clowns get here? <laughs> Uh, what was the question? It <laughs> doesn't matter. <laughs> well, what accomplishment are you proudest of in the Senate? Oh, proudest of. I guess uh, nuclear nonproliferation, I was very active in that. When I first got the Senate, that's a good, good segue there. The, uh, uh, I had thought, once I'd been elected, I'd been through two wars, and I'd seen war up close and personal, seen people get killed, and, and knew the horrors of war, and had to, you know, uh, somebody didn't come back, you got their personal effects together and had to write a letter to their mother or wife or next of kin, and those are bad situations. I couldn't imagine how much more horrible a, uh, a nuclear war would be. And so I had planned when I got to the Senate to uh, really team up with whoever was doing work in that area and do a lot of work in that. Well, I got to the Senate, and uh, there wasn't anybody really leading that, but sort of activity in the Senate at that time. And so, so I sort of, I think it's fair to say I was a, a leader in some of that non-proliferation area. And the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Act of 78 was, it's still on the books now, it's my legislation. And was very interested in that. Uh, I was proud of that, the work we did that. And I traveled a number of places around the world. The once in the news every day now is Pakistan. I was in, uh, went over in, to uh, Pakistan when we knew uh, from intelligence uh, work, which we couldn't talk to them directly about, but we knew exactly what they were doing in developing nuclear weapon. And it was, a, uh, it was termed internationally as the Islamic bomb at that time. It was, and so we, uh, I went to, uh, uh, traveled to Pakistan twice. Uh, and this was way back, it's a long time ago now, it's when President Zia was uh, there. And we met with him and with uh, Jakob Khan, Manir Khan, the defense and foreign ministries. And, uh, and they denied that they were making a bomb at all and we knew what they were doing. We had excellent intelligence on it, but we couldn't alter their course. But anyway, that, uh, some of those things. And, and uh, Taiwan at one time had a program, went to Taiwan and we, so I did a lot of work in that area is the point. And uh, I'm very proud of that. And the, uh, uh, another area, uh, I know to say, to use the term government efficiencies may be considered an oxymoron <laughs> statement. So I took that seriously. And, uh, and some of the things that I, I did then, that uh, legislation that was, uh, some of the departments had uh, CFOs, chief financial officers, and inspectors general, IGs. Well, both the CFOs and IGs were good, except they reported to their agency head. Well, that wasn't quite what I thought was, uh, and what the studies in GAO, the Government Accounting Office, uh, now the Accountability Office, uh, what their studies had shown was the lack of, of uh, independence of those people to really get into dealing with efficiencies in these departments. So we passed legislation that took the 18 top government agencies and departments and uh, made the CFO, made it, uh, mandatory that they have a CFO, number one, and made the reporting line not only to their head, but also a dual reporting line to the appropriate committees of Congress. And that was a big step. It was very controversial. And we did that with the IGs also, and gave them an independence now so that they are far more, uh, far more independent than they were previously. Uh, I wish I could say that we solved all the problems of efficiencies in government. We didn't, but I think it was a step and I've always been been uh, proud of that legislation. The IGs have taken this very seriously, and they, they have uh, uh, an annual meeting of all the IGs now. They're very independent uh, because of this re individual reporting line we gave them. And uh, they always have a, a nice total sheet here. Here's what I did in my department, my department, my department or agency. 
and you total all these things up, and there are many billions of dollars now that they, they are able to save every year because of the IG work. Uh, so I was, I was proud of that work too, and then we did uh, some things, although I wasn't on the committee, in, in education too. I think that, uh, uh, digress aside, I think this country got to be what it is because of education for everybody, more than any other nation ever put forward in the history of the, of the world, and number two was on research and having an educated citizenry and learning new things first out of basic research, uh, tiny little bit of investment, bang, we formed whole new businesses and industries and led the world in only about 120 years from the uh, revolution up to about 1900 and bang, we were a world leader just with that little formula. And I think we better remember that today because we're under a lot more competition yes. today too. Now, you've been a staunch advocate of public service and civic yeah. engagement. Uh, you yourself won the Woodrow Wilson Award for Public Service in 2004. Uh, can you please tell us about the John Glenn School of Public Affairs, how it got started, and what do you think its role is? Because we're facing unprecedented challenges both yeah. domestically and internationally. Yeah. We had the, uh, well, actually, when, when I was getting ready to leave the Senate, we'd had 24 years, and Annie and I thought it was about time to, to uh, move on, do some other things. Uh, since then, there have been a lot of things happened in the last 10 years or so. I wished I was back in there. But uh, uh, anyway, we, uh, uh, the National Archives people recommended they would take all of my Senate papers and the what space papers and memorabilia, things like that, recommended that uh, they go to Ohio State University for, they have an excellent archival facility there and rather than sending them down to Little Muskingum College, which is where we went uh, to school, they didn't have any facilities or, or things like that, and it's not a major hub where people would come in and look at papers or things like this. So we did that and, uh, and sent all those. As a result of that, Ohio State wanted to form an institute of public service and public policy uh, with us. And so that's what we did first, and now it's expanded. We have... Uh, uh, people have come over there from the, uh, to join us now from the uh, School of Behavioral Sciences where they for many years have been giving master's degrees and doctoral degrees in uh, public service. And uh, so we, we are now combined with them. We're in the unusual position now of being a school of public affairs without an undergrad program. Uh, but we grant uh, master's degrees and doctoral degrees in, in this and we're in the process now we hope that by a year from this coming fall, uh, we will have our undergrad program in, in uh, position. And so that was sort of how that whole thing occurred. And it's one which uh, we have, uh, we have offices on the campus there at Ohio State on the Oval, if you're familiar with the campus there. And uh, it's, uh, I don't carry a teaching load, neither one of us won the major teaching load where you have to be at class at a certain time. But we do a lot of seminar work with students in this uh, particular area. <coughs> And we have a, uh, uh, a, uh, an internship program for high school kids from the uh, seven counties in central Ohio. We have a Washington internship program in which we normally have somewhere uh, oh, 15 to 20, usually around 20 Ohio State students are in Washington at any one time doing internships in different agencies or departments or with congressional committees. And uh, those, that's been very successful because the uh, uh, of the kids that have been through that now, and I think we now have, uh, what is it, 500 and some kids, I think, that have been through the program total since it was established. And there are about 20% of them have gone back to Washington and been hired in the departments or agencies in which they interned. Uh, so that uh, speaks well for them, and, and, uh, and uh, so we're very proud of that. Uh, so we're in a lot of different areas there. Uh, Annie, is, uh, Annie was an 85% stutterer most of her life. And I don't know whether you can conceive what a, a handicap that would be with 85% with 85 of the words you would try and say, you'd have some hang up on. And she and I grew up together, so I knew her very well. And, and uh, uh, while it didn't matter to me, it made a difference, of course. I always hoped that she'd be able to overcome that. But none of the therapy had done that until back about, uh, well, it's about 20, 25 years ago now. Uh, she ran into some therapy, or we, we heard it on TV one morning at, uh, about a man had a new concept of, of uh, stuttering and how to cure it. 
uh, at Hollins College at Roanoke, Virginia. And uh, so we called down there, and to make a long story short, she went down there and went through a three-week course, <coughs> excuse me, in which she uh, literally, her, her speaking was completely retrained. And so she knows all of the uh, difficulties and, and all the problems with, with uh, trying to recover from something like that. And so when we were at Ohio State there, they made her an adjunct, well, I'm an adjunct in, in uh, political science there. They made Annie an adjunct professor in uh, speech pathology. And so she goes over uh, quite often and works with the uh, graduate students in speech pathology that are working for their master's and doctoral. And uh, so we, we carry a, a dual load there. So those are the only teaching things that we do. But uh, the school itself will be expanded uh, to carry an undergrad program here in a, a year or so. And uh, I think that'll be a big step forward. Great. Uh, if we could turn back to the space program for a second, um, more than a second, I hope. Since Apollo, there's been some criticism of NASA for lacking direction. Mm -hmm. I mean, Mercury and Apollo, they were very focused and everybody yeah. knew it was going on. Uh, the Obama administration just announced the names of folks who are on a commission to review yeah. uh, NASA's space flight plans. Where do you think NASA should be focusing its energies? Uh, Norm Augustine, who uh, uh, is going to head up that, that thing, and he, of course, has had a long history with, uh, with Lockheed Martin, and uh, he's, he's, been, uh, uh, he's been on several commissions in the past that looked into some of these things. It needs looking into. Uh, I hate to get political here, but I, uh, please feel free, all right. <laughs> and be glad to give anybody rebuttal time after I get done. <laughs> uh, President Bush, for whatever reasons, uh, I don't know whether it was to outdo his father who had suggested we go to Mars, uh, or anyway, in January of 04, beginning of an election year, uh, President Bush just make, came over to NASA, gave a big speech at NASA that got a lot of attention, in which he was directing that the direction of the space program change. We're now going to, the next objectives will be go to the moon, go to Mars. I thought this was great at the time. Uh, I even put out a little press release uh, congratulating the president. He wants to look out to ex expand the program. And to me, the program fits in this area I talked about before of, re of uh, research and the most unusual research. And so uh, he announced this. And I thought that was great and waited for the budget. Well, it turns out his next uh, pronouncement from the White House was NASA's going to do this on the existing budget. Now, I know you've got to think about that a second, because if you can imagine that giving somebody the job of going to the moon and Mars in addition to what they're already doing and no additional budget, that's about as, well, <laughs> this is Sesame Street research or something. <laughs> It just doesn't make sense. Now, the, the really, the, the, and what really irritated me was in the Senate, I had been the floor manager in the Senate every year for several years on the International Space Station. We didn't like the fact that on the shuttle, you could only stay up about two weeks. So your research was limited to about two weeks. We wanted something where you could do a, a set up projects or actually production facilities if you wanted to that would last. And you didn't have to worry about a two week limit on this thing. And there are lots of things like that on, on uh, pro protein, excuse me, protein crystal research and a whole bunch of things, medical research, that you want to do on a, a long-term basis. Well, we couldn't do that on the shuttle, so we designed the, the International Space Station. And granted, it's big and it's, it's very uh, uh, exotic as far as what it can do. It's a big design. If we were doing it over again, it might make it smaller. But it was going to be the world's most unique laboratory in, in benefiting people right here on Earth. And that's when I floor managers, those were my arguments in debate on the floor always was, we're gonna get this benefit back. And it's gonna come back in a way of new medical research and new materials research and things like that, which it has the, the capability of doing and have done a little bit of it. But it was still being built. And is just now being complete. We just now are putting six people up, which was supposed to be the final complement of people until now, most of the crew time has been just two people up there on the station as it was being built and completely filled out. And so the, the uh, objective was to get this thing up where it could do real good research. With the new objective the president gave of going to the moon and to Mars and no additional money, 
the only place they had to cut money from was the, the space station. And so they did, that's exactly what they did under direction. And I've known each one of the NASA administrators and uh, so they've all been very frustrated about the fact that, uh, since then that they couldn't, uh, that you could not, they could not do uh, the research on the station that it was built to do. Now, as of now, as the station is being completed, we'll have about a hundred billion dollar investment in that station. And our, our colleague nations, which we asked to be part of this thing, which was another uh, 15 nations along with us, international consortium on the station, uh, they've put about 12 to 15. So here we have 115 uh, or so billion dollar investment on the station just as it gets completed where it can just start doing research. Because the two people have been up there during most of this period have been able to, uh, they've been mainly tending the systems on the station, doing very, very little research. They mainly keep the thing going. Now we're getting to six people where you can really start doing research and we don't have the money to do the research. A hundred billion investment and not the three to five billion dollars a year for research to do what the thing was designed to do. And meanwhile, you have the Chinese are developing their station. They've already uh, talked about plans to go to the moon and what they're going to do and, and uh, their basic uh, uh, drive for this thing. India has uh, some of their uh, people interested in the same thing. So it's a, I just think that the whole thing is, uh, uh, I want to see us stay in space, but, uh, and, and I, if, if we want to go back to the moon, that's fine with me. I'd, I'd like to see people go back to the moon, although uh, this is not a good way, in my view, uh, to do a trip to Mars or, or someplace farther out in Karen's territory uh, <laughs> that we would like to see people go to sometime. Uh, you're just not going to get the, the uh, uh, well, unless we get the, the support for putting research back on the station now, it'll have been a, it will have been a $100 billion investment in which we reap, we reap some benefit, of course, but uh, not nearly as much as we could. And the debate on the Senate floor, I know, because I was the one managing that on the Senate floor. Uh, the debate on the Senate floor sold this thing to the Congress and the American people back at that time as, uh, as a research laboratory that would benefit people right here on Earth. In my view, since Project Mercury days, way back in the first orbital flight, I always thought at each stage as we go into space, we should maximize the research return for people right here on Earth so they see the benefits of this, see the benefits of this kind of research. Uh, you know, uh, fuel combustion in space. For some reason, and we haven't figured this out yet, nobody has, you have combustion that can be kept going on far less fuel, far less fuel, only about 8% fuel-air ratio uh, as opposed to 70% we have now in your average automobile engine, and this combustion can be kept going. Why? We don't know that yet. Research on things like that and on uh, protein crystal research and things like that in medicine and pharmaceutical research, that's uh, very valuable. Just things like that are uh, I think there's also a, a, a long, on my second flight here, it wasn't just a reward to me that you saw here a while ago that I wanted to go back to space again. Uh, the idea was that, that I was going up at my age because uh, some of the NASA doctors and the people at the National Institute of Aging had been wondering for a long time about the uh, effects of uh, putting someone up there in my age bracket because of this. NASA has uh, uh, noted 52 different changes in the human body that occur in space when you're up there for more than just a few days. And these are things like uh, protein turnover, PTO, where your uh, replacement of protein in the muscles uh, occurs more slowly when they're in space. And it occurs more slowly as part of the natural aging process here on Earth for most people. Uh, body's immune system changes. They become less resistant to uh, disease and infection. Uh, in space. And uh, uh, that happens in most elderly right here on Earth. Your body has, a, has a, becomes less resistant to disease and infection. Uh, there are a number of things like that. There are about a dozen, about ten uh, actual similarities between what happens in the aging process in orbit and what happens in the natural aging process here on Earth. So the idea was if I went up there 
and, made re and did research in this area, could we find out, since I was already older, could we find out what within the human body turns these systems on and off by comparing my reaction and the reaction of the younger astronauts? And so that was the purpose of it. And it, uh, for four days up there during the latter part of the flight, I had 21 different body parameters, brain waves and, and uh, EKG leads and all that uh, were being recorded on a little recorder on my, my belt, uh, which would give all my body parameters they could measure, and including a, a 12 blood samples during different times in this, and I'd analyze the blood in a little hospital analyzer like they use. And, uh, uh, bring back all that data and bring back the frozen blood. That was the objective of this, was to see if we couldn't figure out uh, maybe some of these uh, uh, from this, find out, have a clue as to what turns these systems on and off in the human body with the objective of enabling younger people to stay up longer in space uh, and maybe cut out some of the frailties of old age here on Earth. And so that's the kind of thing I, uh, I'm digressing horribly here from your question, but no <laughs> these are the things that, that I think are important and that I, I think we should be concentrating on. And uh, while I don't object to going to the moon and Mars if, if, we, if we want to pay for it, but uh, the idea that uh, we would cut out this kind of research uh, and not provide the money to continue research on the state when we have 100 billion investment on it, uh, to me, does not make sense, and so I, uh, the uh, the president is the the. Thank you. the <laughs> president Obama right now is at the point where he has to make some of his decisions in this regard as to what we're going to do, and Norm Augustine is the one who's heading up this commission to give him some advice, and that gets back to where you started this. Right. Well, it's, <laughs> question. it's cyclical, isn't it? Because when uh, young people are exposed to the results of this research and all the new discoveries, they get motivated to go into science and engineering yeah. and mathematics, and so it, it propagates yeah, itself. And we're, yes, and, and by the, the, I don't think we should underestimate the effect this has on our young people in wanting to be interested in science and math and technology. And that's not talking down anybody that's in philosophy and religion and whatever <laughs> else it is you're studying, but these other things are the ones that have given us our jobs base, our manufacturing base, our, our all these other uh, things that do come out of math and science and technology, and we are horribly behind the rest of the world right now. Hate to say this, in our K-12 education, it is lousy in those areas right now. Uh, I had not get back to I again, but uh, Dick Riley, who was Secretary of Education, asked me to head up a commission, which I did right at the end of my Senate years, uh, on looking into math and science teaching in the 21st century, which I did. And we had some great people. I had a 25-person commission, and we met for most of, uh, off and on for, for most of a year and put out a report, and uh, we titled the report, Before It's Too Late. And what we found with this, and some of you that are in education here, uh, that are in the department here may be as familiar with this as I am, but what we found in that was that 25% that, uh, and 25% of our science teachers in high school across our country right now, 25% uh, of our science teachers never had any training in teaching science. No, I'm sorry, 25% is in math. They're fill-ins, you know, you're not, you're the assistant football coach or something, and so you're not busy till next fall, so we'd like you to teach geometry. Wow, they're barely ahead of the kids. <laughs> and so you, and so you got 25% you got of the teachers in math uh, were never trained. They're teaching, it's called teaching out of field. And 20% of the science teachers are the same way. In both categories, 30% of them leave the profession within three years and 50% are gone within five years. We, and the reason Dick Riley was so interested in all of this was because he had the uh, Tim study, Third International Math and Science study that had just come out at that time. This was about 10 years ago now, but it's still applicable because, uh, and it was backed up by the NEEP studies, National Education Assessment Program in, in our own country here. It was done in 41 nations over a three year period. And in these 41 nations, they assessed the math and science understanding of the kids. Up to about the fourth grade level, our kids are in the, uh, uh, we're in the top 
two or three in the world out of these 41 nations up to fourth grade. Between there and when our kids get out of high school, they fall to where we are two or three from the bottom. And we don't like to admit this, but it's true. And, it, and so our kids are not being trained now at K-12, through K-12 anyway, uh, through, uh, uh, to really fit in and be superior to the rest of the world, which they should be, or at least equal. And ours, a couple, I remember a couple of the nations behind us, Sri Lanka and, and uh, South Africa are two of the nations behind us. We don't have many behind us. Senator, I'm and sorry so, to anyway, they, anyway, we just need to shape up in that area. Now, if somebody wants extra time, Karen's going to have to yeah. give it to you. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, we, um, I'm sorry to say we have to finish up here. Uh, and I have one final question for you. I think you've just given us a glimpse of what the answer might be. Um, you flew 149 combat missions in World War II in Korea. Uh, you flew into orbit on a rocket and spacecraft combination that had a 40% failure rate before you went up. Uh, and you won re-election to the Senate in a Reagan landslide. Uh, what, if anything, scares you? <laughs> when she gets mad at me. She, she doesn't get mad at me very often, so <laughs> anyway. Thank you Oh, very I don't much. know the, the uh, you know, what get, I get afraid of things just like everybody else. You have some investments right now, we're in a big turmoil. <laughs> uh, keep tab with your broker and things like that. I get as much fear as anybody else, but uh, I think what this country has shown us is if you, uh, you can work through those fears and, and by and large our outlook in this country for the future is even even more glowing than it has been in the past. Uh, the uh, uh, well, let me just close with this. I know I'm, we're way over time here, but uh, the uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson. I like I always liked his uh, some of his writing, and he had a real tough time. You know, he had a, his father was gone. I think I don't know whether he left him or died or something. He had a brother was in a mental asylum. Another one died of TB. He was sick himself for a long time. And, uh, but he always kept an optimistic out, outlook on things. And uh, when some of the people back in his time, the early 1800s, were talking about uh, the difficulties of this new country that we had here, uh, he, he uh, and they were, there were people at that time advocating that perhaps we should go back to a bit more author authoritarian government. It should not be quite as much given everybody just their own way of doing things as, uh, as the new country was set up to do. Uh, and then he wrote in one of his essays words which I always thought were, were pretty good. And he, he wrote as follows. If there is any period one would desire to be born in, is it not the age of revolution when the old and the new stand side by side and admit of being compared? when the energies of all men are searched by fear and by hope, when the historic glories of the old can be compensated by the rich possibilities of the new era. This time, like all times, is a very good one if we but know what to do with it. Well, that's... Thank you. We ran over it.